I I think ultimately, of course, this is a kind of narcissism. This mm. this bot becomes a kind of distorting mirror that is reflecting me back to myself, and that's fundamentally different from the wonder and the challenge of authentic relationships, which is this is not a mirror on me. This is another person who is utterly unique and different. And yet we are, by some amazing, uh, wonderful, God-given ability, creating a relationship, creating an understanding. Welcome to the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast. And I hope this next episode helps you thrive in life and leadership. And if you enjoy it, Hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, that way you'll never miss a thing. So pastors, I know how difficult it can be to keep your sermons feeling fresh and relevant, especially when you're preaching week after week. So whether you're hitting a writer's block or you're in a rush because it's Friday and you're trying to put the finishing touches on your sermon, things don't always go as planned. So to help you, I've created a 10-step preaching cheat sheet. After decades of preaching, I've simplified the whole process of preparation into a series of steps and reminders that can help me and you ensure that our sermons are engaging, relevant, and memorable. Super easy to use, 10 simple prompts with examples, and you can start using it as early as this Sunday. So just go to preachingcheatsheet.com or click the link in the description. You'll get a copy sent to you for free today. Today's episode is also brought to you by Compassion. Words are powerful, but as a communicator, it's far too easy to underestimate the impact of experiences. So when people experience God in a way that is outside their usual rhythms and routines, lives change. That's why I encourage you to bring a compassion experience to your church. It's an interactive way to witness the realities of life for children in poverty and the church's incredible response. Families in your community will see how the gospel is transforming lives around the world. And because not everybody can go on a mission trip, you can bring the experience to you. Compassion is currently working with the local church to release over 2.2 million children from poverty in Jesus' name. And I have personally supported them for years. To learn more, go to compassion.com slash carry. And now to today's episode. Wow. Professor John Wyatt, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Yeah, yeah. So we're talking about AI, and I'd love to start with uh, something. I mean, I watch the movie like everybody else, but I'm not, I'm not a scientist. The Turing test and how that has played a role in our understanding of machine learning and AI. Can you briefly describe the Turing test? Sure. So Alan Turing was a remarkable genius um, around wartime, played a, a very important role in uh, the Enigma a code cracking for the Allies. And uh, in 1950, he wrote a paper which was really addressing the question of, are machines capable of thinking? Yes. And if they are, how would we ever know? What kind of test could we develop that would, that would help us to know where the machine can think? And he came up with this uh, an idea, a thought experiment, uh, yeah. Initially, he called it the imitation game, and it then gradually became known as the Turing test. And the idea was you sat in a darkened room, you watched a screen in which um, a teletype came across, because that was the only way you could communicate with computers. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were two rooms behind the screens. In one room, there was a human being typing on a keyboard. In another room, there was a great supercomputer. And, and Turing said, if you couldn't tell whether or not it was the human typing on the computer or it was the uh, t typing on the keyboard or it was the computer, uh, then we can uh, define that computer is able to think. That's what we call thinking. Uh, as, far as, as far as he was concerned, it was a kind of operational definition uh, for, for what it meant that a computer could think. And so that's been around ever since, this idea that if... Uh, the output of a computer is indistinguishable from that of a human, then uh, it does that prove that the machine is thinking? That, or to put it another way, is does that prove that the machine is intelligent? Mm. And ever since, it's been a, a huge controversy. Uh, what, what does this really mean? Um, 
I think it's true to say that the latest versions of things like ChatGPT and so on have completely blasted through the Turing test. Yes. I mean, I've been fooled a number of times uh, by people said, you know, we've got this very interesting question or somebody's just produced, what do you think of this? And I said, oh, that's quite good, you know, and, and actually it was produced by a machine. So it's now become almost, um, you know, computers are capable of generating text, which is completely indistinguishable from that generated by humans, which of course is a huge problem now for people like journal editors and for teachers and educators and so on. Yes, it is interesting. That was going to be my next question. So have we passed the Turing test? Because as you indicated, just this morning, I was on ChatGPT, and this will timestamp it because if you're listening two years from now, you'll probably be like, oh, that was so <laughs> primitive. But yeah, uh, what I, I asked ChatGPT because, you know, I filled out my profile. It knows what I do. It searched me. It knows who I am. And it now has a name. I called it Isaiah because it has AI in it. Um, so I asked, I asked my chat GPT, um, what can you do for me that I haven't explored yet? And it knows our whole history. And it gave me a list of like 10 things, one of which was designing quizzes. Well, believe it or not, on my workflow for this week, I had to write a quiz for this Art of Leadership Academy I created. And I thought, all right, I'm going to give chat GPT a shot at it. It was great. Like it might have taken me seven or eight hours to produce something that perhaps wasn't as good. And it completed it in about 38 seconds. <laughs> and I mean, it was complicated and, and I kept making it better and iterating. So now my next step is to go back and actually make sure it makes sense and everything. But like, it's astounding at how good it is. And I've sat in brainstorming session after brainstorming session with human beings. And we would not have produced a test that good in three or four hours, let alone 38 seconds or 20 seconds or whatever it was. Absolutely. And I think the truth is you haven't seen anything yet. I mean, Correct. the rate yeah. at which this is going uh, is, is utterly extraordinary. And and therefore, I think all bets are off. In, in terms of the ability of machines to generate apparently highly intelligent and original text, I think there's no doubt that that is now possible. Well, and to that end, uh, and I mean, you'll get so many different opinions on this, depending on who you ask, John, but where do you see AI going in the next two to three years? Your book, The Robot Will See You Now, makes some predictions. It's a collection of essays from different experts. Your field is medicine. I've been reading, not widely, but, but, but you know, more than one or two articles and books on medicine and AI. It looks extremely promising on everything from cancer research to robotic care for elderly people to helping with dementia to all of those things. Where do you see AI going in the next couple of years? Well, you know, predicting the future in the current climate is a complete mugs game. Yes. And uh, yeah. I think that I can really understand why investors and futurologists and so on are feeling extremely unsettled because yes. I think we just cannot predict. I think there's a huge amount of hype around and I, I think undoubtedly some of the hype is going to burst and um, there's going to be disappointments and failures. And um, I, I think that uh, one thing, for instance, that might make a huge difference is if if the lawyers get in and there are some massive lawsuits claiming mm. that these models are infringing copyright and, you know, huge legal claims suddenly worth billions of dollars get yeah. launched, I could suddenly see, you know, the whole field suddenly <laughs> slamming on the brakes because, right. you know, so... I, I, I think predicting the future is a mugs game, but assuming something like that doesn't happen, um, the rate of progress is astonishing. There are already being developed specialized medical versions of ChatGPT, which are trained entirely on the entire medical and scientific literature, and which are designed specifically for, phys for physicians. And already these things are capable of passing, you know, postgraduate physicians' exams. And I think it's likely that within a matter of years, physicians will have available to them these extraordinarily powerful tools which can provide instantaneous advice, diagnosis, treatment recommendations, uh, and so on. 
Um, of course, there are all kinds of issues about, you know, who is ultimately legally responsible. If I, have, as a physician, you know, this is recommending treatment A, and I'm thinking, actually, I think that's a really bad idea. I wouldn't give that to a dog. Yeah. yeah. You know, who do I believe and who's responsible if I then say, well, you know, the computer said yes. So uh, you can see real challenges, but there's no doubt it's going to make a huge inroads into, into that kind of area, diagnosis for physicians in terms of image analysis, any kind of analysis of data, uh, scans and so on. AI is going to, I think, massively increase diagnostic accuracy. I think it's going to work in the plumbing, you know, the logistics of uh, healthcare, um, the kind of things that go on under the without you noticing, and mm. often that's one of the major problems in healthcare that just we don't get the right information to the right people at the right time, and so on. And I think AI is transforming logistics and will continue to make it much more efficient. There are other fascinating things like mental health bots, you know. So, in theory. Um, every person on the planet who has a mental health issue, you know, and we're talking probably billions of people, mm -hmm. every single one of them could be carrying around with them a specialized conversational AI agent, which is able to monitor their mental health, which is constantly um, providing advice, cognitive behavioral therapy, reminding them, uh, monitoring their uh, their mental state and so on. And um, you know, I think this is becoming technically possible. Another fascinating area is what's called wearable tech, you know, that, that mm -hmm. we're going to be all wearing devices which are going to be constantly monitoring all kinds of physiological variables and then sending them off and being analysed continuously by AIs and warning us of, uh, of what's going on. So again, just astonishing rate of change. I, it, one of the fascinating things that happens with this kind of automation is that it it decomposes what traditional um, disciplines, professions have been. So up until now, there's been a sort of general agreement, you know, this is what a lawyer does. This is what an accountant does. This is what a physician does. This is what a journalist does. And Increasingly, that is no longer the case. And I think that the job of a physician is going to get broken down into a whole lot of different tasks and roles. And then the questions will be, well, why do we need a qualified doctor to do that? And do we need to breed new, new professions like health informatics or hmm. health database management? Because actually, these people are going to be much more valuable than that old guy who did five years of anatomy and physiology and dissection and learning about pharmacology. I mean, that's all gone for the birds now. You know, we need people who are able to understand how large language models engage with health databases and so on. So yes, we, we might need a few physicians, but maybe we're going to need large quantities of other people who we can hardly imagine at the moment. Yeah, it's fascinating to see where it'll go. And you touched on a couple of things that I wanted to talk about. So I want to start with transhumanism. I mean, you've spent your life's work in healthcare. And right now, at least from the podcast I listen to, it seems to be the province of the the uber rich, right? I want to live forever. You know, Walt Disney freezed his body in the hopes that at some point he would be able to come back to life. I'm not sure that's happening. But, you know, whether it's uh, Dr. Peter Atia or... Uh, Andrew Huberman from Huberman Labs, podcasters like that who are always talking about health optimization, uh, the supplements you should take, the strength training you should take. And the whole idea is that, you know, we'll live to 100 and be in vibrant health. But the next phase of that is, well, can you live much longer and can you perhaps never die? Can we, re we reverse it? Now, that's all speculative at that point. I would love uh, sort of your thoughts on, on transhumanism, and we're definitely going to deal with the theological implications of that as well. But talk about transhumanism and what you've seen and where you think that might be heading. Well, certainly it's an idea whose time has arrived. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you can go back and you can see that this idea has been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years. The fountain of, of youth, you right? Know, the fountain of, of youth, mm -hmm. of, of alchemy, of you know, people trying to find ways of living forever and so on. And again, in the Enlightenment, interestingly, you know, in the European Enlightenment, there were many 
writers like Diderot and others who were speculating about what would be possible to transform human existence. So the idea has been around for a long time. It's just that the technology is at last catching up with these dreams. And it is fascinating to me is that there are this this body of extremely rich and extremely scared old people, mainly yes. men, who are, uh, you know, they've always thrown their wealth at any problem they've met in their lives and now they're, they're staring death in the face and the obvious thing is to throw their wealth at this one and see if we can find a solution so so you know i think that as i said that idea has has come to fruition what i'm fascinating though is that that although that i think is entirely speculative and that so far there's precious little evidence that this is really going to make dramatic differences I mean, people talk about the escape velocity, you know, that if you can overcome the deterioration that is happening with age, bit by bit, you sort of repair it, you get less and less and less, and eventually you sort of take off, and then you go and live forever. But, you know, I think this is science fiction. Yeah. What is fascinating to me, though, is that I think there is low-tech transhumanism is already happening. Hmm. So if you think about things like cosmetic surgery... You know, I, I don't like my body as it is. I'm going to change it. I'm going to make myself look I'm 25. I'm going to, you know, alter my structure, my body structure, what I like. If, if you think of things like other forms of, um, well, even, you know, massive uh, body transformation, body building, uh, it, the idea that I can take control over my body you think of sort of drugs to enhance intelligence or to focus concentration. Uh, lots of different techniques. All the basic idea is I don't need to accept my body as it's been given to me. I am going to choose a better body, a, a faster, slicker, more attractive um, uh, body. And so, so this idea of, of, of changing the ultimate structures of my body it's, it's around and i've no doubt that if drugs start to become available which promise you know extending lifespan or increasing intelligence or increasing athletic ability or endurance there's going to be a, a huge market for it i mean this idea is already around and very current mm. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I tend to agree with your assessment. I see some of these folks who have spent like lots of money on uh, pursuing this goal of living forever. And I see them on video or their pictures and I'm like, yeah, but they still look their age. They still look 70. You know, it's not like a 70 year old who looks like he's 22. There is a, a certain inevitability to age. But it's funny how that seems to be the one thing that we try to uh, nail down. Another thing you hinted at very briefly in the field of menti mental health is AI companions, somebody to really cheer you up. But I've done some reading around, um, I mean, this is like caring for the elderly. You've got stuff in the robot we'll see you now about uh, perhaps being great uh, treatments for dementia. But I've also seen it turn out relationally. And there have been some experiments already in sexual AIs and uh, romantic AIs, et cetera, et cetera. And I find that um, disturbing <laughs> on a fairly sure. deep level. That uh, and, and the argument is, I think, and I'd, I'd, I'd love your take on it, is people have problems, right? Anyone who's been married for 10 minutes or in a relationship <laughs> for more than a month is like, oh, well, yeah, okay, we have another human here on the end and I don't know how to deal with them and they don't know how to deal with me and we got to work it through. And, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but your AI could be perfect. Your AI might never let you down, would always know exactly what to say. What are the implications? Can you explain the emerging field of love and even sexual robotics in AI, where that might go and what the implications might be? Well, again, I think this is a huge development. And yeah. I, like you, I, I feel quite uneasy about it because, mm. um, as you say, all human relationships are messy and imperfect. And you know, something that every young guy discovers, don't you? You have this sort of vision of the ideal partner, you know, the ideal woman, the fantasy woman, yeah. you know, and one day when I meet her, it's all going to be fantastic. And then you meet a real woman, you know, and you fall in love with them. And then 
wow, this is not the fantasy I thought at all. And, you know, here's another person who's pushing back on me and who's got their own view and their own opinions. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And, you know, I'm having... for which I'm better as a result, but <laughs> but that notwithstanding, yeah. And it's, and it's very different. And, uh, you know, it's interesting to me that many people working in this industry, many of them are the kind of the nerds and the geeks who've mm. often been found it very difficult to establish good relationships with other, other human beings. Good point. Yeah. Good point. And, and yet, so they've been creating their ideal girlfriend or boyfriend. And, uh, you know, I can't find them in real life. So let's get, let's work it out a program that will, that will function like, who will always do what I want, who will always be friendly, who will always be compliant, who will, who will always be my ideal woman or, a man or whatever. And so I I think ultimately, of course, this is a kind of narcissism. This, mm. this bot becomes a kind of distorting mirror that is reflecting me back to myself. And that's fundamentally different from the wonder and the challenge of authentic relationships, which is this is not a mirror on me. This is another person who is utterly unique and different and yet we are by some amazing uh, wonderful god-given ability creating a relationship creating an understanding uh, and ultimately love that this this wonderful experience of of loving and being loved by another by someone who is different from me and yet who still is interested and loves me and cares for me but it is, it's an interesting uh, pastoral moment, too. I'm thinking about pastors who are preaching to their churches. And, you know, we've talked about dating apps for a long time in our series. But, you know, it's, it's, it's very realistic that if you're preaching on this now, not in the future, you would have to talk about bots and finding love online in virtual relationships, not just with somebody you went to high school with, but like in, in virtual relationships. And I think, you know, what you said about transhumanism finding its its early low-tech version in Botox or, you know, working out to get that ideal body, I think that's also true. Like you see the average age at which people are having sex going up. You see people delaying marriage. You see people paralyzed by choice because, you know, 50 years ago, if you lived, you hopefully met someone at work, at home, or like not at home, but in your community or at school, and you usually got married. Your standards were lower. And now you could be matched with one of four billion people so or eight billion. So now, now you know, the standard is, is much higher. Um, what, do you, what do you sense is happening to human happiness? You mentioned it as, as a form of narcissism, which I think is a, a great uh, understanding. But like as we look for that idealized person, what happens to real people? Well, the danger is that what I would describe as an instrumentalized understanding of relationships comes in. In other words, the purpose of a relationship, the purpose of any relationship is to make me feel good, is to, is to create warm feelings in my innermost being. And frankly, when I talk to these human beings, sometimes they make me feel good, but sometimes they make me feel terrible. And I get all kinds of sort of negative emotions going on. But if I can find a bot and I just sit down at the end of a long, harrowing day and I talk to this bot and it's so intelligent and so sympathetic and so caring, it just makes me feel good. And then the answer comes, well, surely, if it makes me feel good, does it really matter? that um, it's just clever programming. You know, I, and that somewhere in my mind, I know that this is just clever programming. But if it makes me feel good, if it gives me this sense that someone loves me, that someone cares about me, that I'm special, um, what, what's wrong with it? And, and the, you know, there are many people who are going to make that argument. They're already mm -hmm. starting to make that argument. I think we're going to hear that argument more and more. You know, what's wrong with it? Why should we say oh, well, this is second rate. You have the courage to raise some good questions, one of which is, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? And I think we've explored that in the human context, and I'll keep exploring it. It's a great question. 
you mentioned that even ChatGPT has blown past the Turing test and it's impossible to tell whether a human produced it or whether a machine produced it. But when it comes to transhumanism, because we could get into neural links if you want to, you know, where you really meld with the machine, um, or when it comes to romantic or sexual uh, bots, where where does the image of God play? Like if, if people who are made in the image of God create creatures, can those creatures be made in the image of God? Does that does that follow philosophically? Well, these these are deep, deep questions, aren't they? And yeah. it does make us think. You know, one of the things in my career, which I've been, which is part of why I found it so fascinating, is it seems to me whenever technology advances in this kind of area, including in health technology and science and AI, it does raise that question again. What does it mean to be human? Mm. Um, and Interestingly, one of the standard ways in which uh, we've answered that is we've always said, well, humans can do this, 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 and this, this, and nobody else can do that. You know, no animal can do that. No machine can do that. Nobody else can do that. So our human uniqueness must depend on things like language, on being able to uh, communicate, on being creative, on being able to reason, on, on et cetera, et cetera. And, and then we're confronted with these very sophisticated programs, which seem to be able to do an awful lot of the things that we thought only human beings could do. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a chapter in, in that book, The Robot Will See You Now, written by a friend of mine, Robert Song, who's a distinguished theologian. And he describes this, and he says we're in danger of coming up with what he calls the human of the gaps. Uh, you know, so there's been this thing of the idea of the God of the gaps, that we use God as an explanation whenever science uh, can't explain anything. You know, so we say, oh, well, that must have been God because science right. can't explain it. And then as science gets better and better at explaining things, God gets pushed into the gaps and gets smaller and smaller. You know, God is, well, mm-hmm. God can still do this. Science can explain everything, but the bit that God is needed for gets smaller and smaller. And, and Robert Song suggests the same thing is happening now for human beings, that, you know, the, the things that human beings can do that are unique seem to be getting smaller and smaller. And, we're, and the danger is, just like with the God of the gaps, the human of the gaps becomes more and more fragile and, um, and and hard to argue because the machines are getting so much better. And, and so Robert Song goes on and saying that, you know, actually we need to step back and say, isn't our human distinctiveness more in terms of what is our calling? What has God called us to? So it's not so much in our properties and in our abilities because it turns out that many of the human abilities can be reproduced by machines. Our uniqueness, he says, and he takes it back to that early chapter in Genesis 1, is because God, the being made in God's image is related to now exercise dominion in, on the earth and rule over the rest of creation. And that, he says, is a godlike calling which is given only to human beings. It isn't given to machines and it can't be taken away from human beings. That is our calling, even if it turns out the machines are better at doing many things than we are. Well, I was going to say, that, that could very well, I mean, that whole question of singularity, right, where we lose the ability to control the machines and they take over and, you know, all the dystopian sci-fi, et cetera. Uh, but it, your, your, your book plays, I think it's your book, I, I've read fairly widely on this, uh, about the definition of what makes someone in the image of God. And for centuries, it was intelligence, right? Mm-hmm. It was our ability to do what you and I are doing right now and what the listeners are doing to interact with ideas. Yep. And we looked at the animal kingdom and said, mm, I don't think they do that. Now, what we're learning about the animal kingdom is uh, not so fast, maybe even trees talk, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> like there might be a generalized intelligence <laughs> even in trees that we're now discovering, I read The Hidden Life of Trees recently yeah, by Robert right. Wall, Wallinger, I think his name is. Yeah. Fascinating. I'd yeah, love wonderful. to interview him. Wonderful <laughs> book, you know. But even yeah. if some of that is exaggerated or misplaced, I mean, there's, there's a wider intelligence in creation too. So it leaves us. And, and would, you, would you agree 
with, uh, with your theologian friend that perhaps the ability to rule over or to have dominion is what it means to be made in the image of God? Or would you nuance it further? I think that's one of the things, but I think mm-hmm. there are other aspects. And sure, I, sure. Think, um, I, I, I think I I think I find the concept of being a person, of being created a person, is a really important and central idea. And that is that to be a person is to be, in some astonishing way, created like the persons of the Trinity. So, the, mm. interestingly, the 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 concept of the person was not there in ancient Greek and Rome in, in their philosophy. They understood the persona, in other words, the outward mask that an individual wear, wears. Yeah. But the idea that there was an underneath was a person who was always unique. And that actually was a was not an idea that was uh, widely held in ancient Greece and Rome. And it was the Christian theologians, as they reflected about what the Bible taught about the Holy Trinity, they came up with this formulation that God was one God, one substance with three persons, mm-hmm. the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And that the persons were in some sense constituted by their relations. So the most profound thing you can say about the first person of the Trinity is that he is Father. He's always referred to as Father. That's his being. And yet, he cannot be a Father unless there is the Son. So Mm. the very being of the Father depends on the existence of the Son. His being is constituted by his relations. And similarly, the Son cannot be who he is without the existence of the Father. So to be a person is already to be in relation. And so then when God makes us in his image, he creates us also as persons in relation. We are we are in a network of relationships. We have a father and a mother. We have siblings. We have uh, sons and daughters. We have friends. We have, this is, and they are constitutive of who we are. And ultimately, we are related to God. Um, And so that personhood is a gift which is in our creation. And it isn't a gift which, as far as we know, God has given to machines. So however clever they are, however much their processing power um, increases and increases, they will never be a person reflecting the persons of the Trinity, locked into relationships, giving to the other. This is a unique gift that God has given to Homo sapiens. I've, I've been encouraged to, or not encouraged, that's the wrong word. I've been surprised at how our theology is lagging in this whole area. And I really appreciate what you just said, because, you know, if you look at our culture, we've dehumanized so much. I mean, the machines haven't done it. We become tribal. So if you don't vote like me, I don't like you. Uh, we become more classist, I think you could argue, Mm. in the 21st Mm. century, where if you don't make the same amount of money as I do, I look down on you. If you're homeless, get out of my backyard. We fail to see the personhood Mm. in, in other people. I really like your working definition. And when you look at Gen Z and you look at mental health, which we've already referenced, a lot of that is the death of community. And there are now atheists who are saying, okay, I don't really miss the church, but I miss the com- the community of the church. And we always used to get together and we used to, you know, there'd be rich and poor and different colors together mm-hmm. in one place and we would be the community. And I wonder if our theology really needs to be accentuated in a time like this to help us, because if we're falling in love with these robots we talked about and, and having relationships with them, we're dehumanizing other people even more because now you even further do not stand up to my level of scrutiny or expectation. You know, I think that's absolutely at the heart of this. I've just come back from a week, a church family week away, holiday week away, and it was just the most wonderful experience. And what it was is that we didn't have our smartphones and we didn't have our screens and our technology, but what we had was the church family from zero to 100 and everybody was there, and we were just enjoying one another. 
and enjoying hanging out with one another and spending time together. And we all came away just feeling there's something profoundly pro-human about that. It, 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 it reinforces who we are, and it's so distant, different from the lives that so many of us lead, locked into our screens, locked into technology, engaging with machines, but not really in this deep uh, IU learning together, sharing together. And that, that's the way we're made. And, and I don't think anything is going to change that. And so I do think there's actually an opportunity here because, you know, we're living in a world which has so much got such relational problems, as you say, you know, a kind of relational deficits. Mm. And if Christians are really living out this kind of community life of sharing together, of learning from one another, of, of caring for one another, of bearing one another's burdens, you know, I think that's a fantastic witness uh, to a cynical and a desperately lonely world. Well, and you could argue, I mean, you've talked about the Roman Empire, that that was a unique contribution. One of the unique contributions to Christianity was this idea of personhood. And there's dignity in slaves, and there's dignity in women, and there's dignity in people that for millennia and by virtually every other culture had been cast aside, slaughtered, seen as worthless. Uh, it's it's That's interesting. Right. And the fascinating thing is that, that when you think about intelligence and processing power, immediately you grade people on a spectrum, you know, from Einstein at one end to the, the really dumb idiot <laughs> at the other. Uh, yeah. But when you think about personhood, it's ultimately egalitarian. We are all the same, however bright, however stupid, however fast, however slow. We're all uniquely valuable and precious because we're all persons. I'm not sure if this is a question or an observation, but Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, wrote the foreword to your book. And I'm wondering, I mean, I know you know him, etc. Um, where are you seeing helpful theological conversations these days? Uh, is there anything you're seeing from him or in the wider church? Well, you know, we were very grateful that Justin... Welby was prepared to write a foreword, and he was very generous in his comments. I, I think there are more theologians starting to recognize the problem. But I have to say, you know, I, I ran a research project based at the Faraday Institute in Cambridge, which was intended to get together theologians to discuss these issues. And I was rather disappointed that it was quite hard to find uh, serious theologians who were prepared to do it. I mean, most of them thought it was a complete waste of time. And um, I, I, so I think we've got a long way to go. Interestingly, I'm now feeling that there are more church leaders and theologians suddenly saying, good grief, you know, almost like good rabbits grief, in a yeah. headlight, you know. <laughs> What's up. happening? What's happening? We need to think about this. Yeah. You know, and, um, but I do think we're a long way behind in our Christian thinking. And part of the problem, you know, is so many theologians and church leaders, Bible scholars and so on, they've all done humanities from the time they were at high school. Uh, they're not interested in science. They don't, they're not interested in science fiction. They're not interested in technology. And so it's like this whole world just almost passes them by. And um, so I think there is a real need for a new conversation between uh, people who are really engaged in the technology and thinking about these kind of questions and uh, theologians and, and Christian thinkers. And we need to work together to try to develop uh, a response to what's going on. Because I just sense... These two fundamental questions are, are constantly being asked. Number one, what does it mean to be human? And how do we understand uh, our Christian understanding of what it means to be human in the light of these astonishing developments? And then number two, and I think this question is just as important, but it, it is very much underdeveloped, and that is what kind of world do we want to create in the future? What kind, what's the end game of all this technology? What, what kind of world do we want to create for our children? And I, that question 
doesn't seem to get asked much. It's, it seems that question. the assumption is that this technology just has its own momentum. It's going where it's going. Nobody can do anything to stop it. Nobody can do anything to change its direction. It is just a huge sort of monstrosity rolling under its own momentum. And that, that's called technological determinism. And, it, and, it's a, and it's folly, you know, because, I mean, who is doing the technology? Answer, it's human beings. And we are not determined. We mm. are free. And we are making choices. And, and so the, the question we need to ask is, what does the future of a technological future, what would it look like? A world in which AI was actually helping human beings to become more human, to flourish. Um, what would that look like? What kind of world do we want to create? I mean, one of the fascinating things to me is that for many tech people, the, the future world is a kind of frictionless world. It's a world where whatever you desire, whatever you wish, whatever your thought is, ping, it's there. It happens instantly, frictionless. Don't worry about it. No effort. Instantaneous. And yet, if you think about it, what it means to be human, Everything we've ever achieved as human beings has involved struggle, frustration, perseverance, disappointment, uh, and so on and so on, pain. The, and it seems like these things are essential for human beings to flourish. Mm -hmm. So is it going to be possible for human beings to grow and develop and become mature and rounded in a technological world which is completely frictionless? Or do we actually need friction? Do we need the challenge, the grit, the difficulty to, to grow and become the people we were meant to be? In that last five minutes, my mind's going in so many different directions, John, because I think that could spawn some great philosophical questions and articles. You're right, there is an inherent struggle. You can even look at parenting techniques over the decades. And we can argue that we've so tried to insulate our kids that in some measure, we've not set them up for the reality of life. And that's why some would argue so many are struggling into mm. their late teens and 20s going, life isn't fair. And the answer to that is, no, it's not. And the Christian faith actually has an awful lot to say about that. There's nowhere in the Bible, where Christians just snap their fingers and everything works out exactly the way we hoped it would in the end. I mean, perhaps that's heaven, but it's certainly not, <laughs> it's not, not, a, not no. on this side. It's not right? on this side. No, it's, yeah. it's a pilgrimage, and we're taking up our cross, and we're exercising perseverance, and we're hanging on in there. I mean, that's, yeah. that's how life has always been. And, and yet, that is the, the training ground in which we are developing. Interesting, isn't it? The one place... Mm -hmm where this is acceptable is in the gym. So everybody knows no pain, no gain, you know, feel the burn, you know, if you're, if you're not really in agony, it's not doing anything. <laughs> in the gym, we understand you need resistance, but everywhere else in life, oh, no, no, no. everywhere else in life, we want friction free. <laughs> Well, let this be a call to budding theologians, philosophers. Uh, you, you, I was not trying to lead a, a research project at Cambridge University in England, but I was trying to pull four or five episodes on this podcast together, and I concur. It was exceedingly difficult to find qualified people to talk about the philosophical and theological implications of AI at a, at a semi-serious level. And I'm, I'm so grateful you said yes to this. So I think we need a new generation of mm -hmm. people who think about these things. But all of this, I mean, there's, there's so many other issues we could touch on, as, as you indicated before we started to record. It's like, this could be a day-long seminar. Yes, 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 it could be. Um, agency, human agency. So a couple of years ago, three, four years ago, Tristan Harris came out with a social dilemma. He's been sounding this since the mid-2010s, former Google ethicist, I believe. And he's been saying, we're losing our agency. The algorithms are doing it. You know, you're not, you're not controlling your phone. Your, your, your phone is controlling you. And he was right. Yuval Noah Harari has said mm -hmm. very similar things. He fear, he thinks that the greatest thing that we can do is to struggle for our agency, that we still have the ability to make decisions. And you just framed AI in that context, that we don't have to surrender this. It's not technological determinacy. Where do you think we are 
in that right now. Do you do you think we are at risk of losing our agency uh, in the midst of this? And if so, what would you do about that? Yeah, you see, the the problem is that the forces that are aligned against us have become absolutely enormous. Yes, uh, because some of the best minds in the world have been devoting every second of every day and every uh, you know every technological innovation to find ways of manipulating us more mm-hmm. effectively and it's become an astonishingly sophisticated science i mean uh in i think it was stanford university created a whole uh new kind of discipline called they call social physics and th- their idea is that just as we can understand the laws of physics which govern uh you know the way that billiard balls and rockets and everything else fly well let's find work out those fundamental laws that govern relationships and let's let's use mm. them to manipulate people um to in order to make money. Oh, I mean, originally, I mean, yeah. interestingly, it didn't start out like that. It started no. out as just interesting science. And let's just observe uh, how it works. Let's just try and understand people better. But quite rapidly, um, you know, they, they were trying to work out, how are we going to fund all this? You know, th- th- there must be a business model here. I mean, it, it started out as an open source, you know, we'll make it free, you know, everyone is, it's all going to be fine. It's, it was kind of this kind of hippie culture that was coming out of Silicon Valley, really, you mm-hmm. know, for, from the 60s and 70s. But, and the big question was, how are we going to get a business model? And then, snap, it's advertising. And, and the way we're going to do it is we've, we've suddenly discovered we can predict how people are going to choose and we can manipulate them. We can... Um, and we're going to use the same techniques, sophisticated techniques that started out. There was a behavioral psychologist called Skinner, B.F. Skinner. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he did all this stuff with pigeons in boxes and working out how to get the pigeon to respond uh, and to manipulate the behavior of the pigeon. And he developed a whole science based on behavioral modification. And they basically taken the ideas of Skinner and ramped them up uh, massively and made it a much more sophisticated approach. One of the fascinating things is that, mm. so Skinner put a, a pigeon in a, into a box and there happened to be a little lever and every time the lever was pressed, a little food pellet came out. And to begin with, the pigeon scattered around the place and eventually by accident, uh, a wing flapped on the the lever, a pellet came out, the pigeon, and then bit by bit, the pigeon learned that to peck on the pellet, and every time the pigeon pecked on the pellet, out came a, and picked on the lever, out came a pellet. And so Skinner plotted what happened. And what he showed, interestingly, is that to begin with, the pigeon pecked more and more and more and more. And then eventually the pigeon got bored and stopped pecking. And then he discovered, if he put a random function in this, so that most of the time when the pigeon pecked on the pellet, nothing happened. But every so often, completely randomly, a food pellet came out. Then lo and behold, the pigeon spent the whole time pecking at the pellet and would never stop. And so that's how the internet works. It's a yeah, random it's rewarder. A slot machine it's of... a slot machine, but it doesn't deliver every time. In fact, a lot of the time it doesn't deliver. And you go there and you peck away and you visit websites and you so on. And then every so often, bingo, there's a food pellet. And you go, oh, that's good. And lo and behold, you're going to go on pecking and pecking. And so this thing hmm. has been brilliantly designed, but it's basically treating us like pigeons in a, in a box. And, uh, and what's driving it is shareholder value. And there are now billions and billions of investors uh, driving this. And, and he, I sometimes feel almost sorry for the CEOs like Mark Zuckerberg and the others um, because the truth is they don't have any freedom either. If they were to take no. their foot off the gas pedal, if they were to say, oh, hang on a minute, I think we're not, I'm not quite sure this is right, they'd be out of a job. The investors would move in and say, yeah, but we've got billions riding on this. Um, so, so we're in this 
incredibly powerful capitalist uh, model. And somehow, the equivalent, I think, is what was happening with, you know, the robber barons of the 19th century, the oil uh, and the railroad barons. And in the end, the state had to step in and say, you won't be allowed to just uh, maximize profits and, and run massive monopolies. We've got to regulate. We've got to break break up monopolies. And I think ultimately that's what's going to happen. And it's happening in the EU a lot faster than it's happening in America. Um, you raised you raise some really good points. So if you think about the space race, it was government funded. And I'm not making a political or economic mm-hmm. statement here, sure. but you know, who, who put uh, a man on the moon? It was the US government using NASA, et cetera, mm-hmm. et cetera. So it was mm-hmm. large. And there was a whole like private sector defense industry that, that, uh, that came about as well around that time. But um, if you look at what's happening right now, AI is being almost 100% driven by the private sector. And you raise the possibility at the beginning of this conversation that perhaps the one thing that would put a stop to it is not the moratorium that everybody signed and nobody obeyed uh, or the call for it, but it would be a bunch of lawyers with billion-dollar lawsuits attacking the bottom line. And then they're like, oh, but... You've also got good actors and bad actors, right? Like on the same way, we've been talking largely about, I guess we would say benevolent actors, whether you want to talk about their motive for profit as benevolent or malevolent doesn't really matter. But you've also got criminals trying to develop AI that will, you know, empty every bank account and destroy infrastructures and so on and so forth. So the argument is, well, if the good actors stop, the bad actors keep going and we end up behind on that. Um, and, and again, the people lagging behind it, the philosophers and the theologians going, ah, oh, really? <laughs> you know, uh, exactly so what right. do you do about that race? Like it almost creates an inevitability to the continual advance. And then there's a certain point, right? The singularity at which we are no longer, we no longer have agency. The machines themselves have taken over and now they are writing their own code and we don't know what's going to happen. Speculate on that future. And, and the thing that's so surprising, we're not even 12 months into chat GPT when we're recording this and we're all going, holy cow, are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. So I think I I think this is the terrible dilemma we you know we find yes. ourselves in uh, you know and and of course what you haven't mentioned is China but that's the other yes. great fear so if we stop doing this if we take our foot off the gas pedal uh, then all that's going to happen is that China is going to sweep past us and wipe us and blow us out of the water so. Mm-hmm. Um, a lo- in other words, a lot of it is driven by fear. It's it's uh, it's fear of losing what we've gained. It's it's fear of losing profits of um, uh, fear and greed. I mean, don't they say that's what drives the stock market? And I think mm-hmm. you know that's what's driving that's what's driving this. Where is it going? I don't know. I do think there are increasing voices, um, and certainly not just people of faith or Christians, I mean, increasing voices from elsewhere saying, we've got to find a way of controlling this. And Tristan Harris and his Center for Humane Technology is a very good example, I think, doing remarkably good stuff. And I think there's a good place for what's sometimes described as co-belligerence. In other words, that um, Christians and other people of faith should be prepared to collaborate with people who who may be complete atheists or oh, totally. maybe politically totally different from us. And yet, together we agree this is such an important issue that we've got to find ways of working together and collaborating in order to, to, to um, control this in a way which is going to be for the good of, of all humanity. I think another thing that from a Christian point of view is always important, and we see this throughout the scriptures, and that is that Right way back in the Old Testament, you know, who were the people that God was most concerned of in Israeli society? Answer, it was the vulnerable. It was the widows, the orphans, the immigrants, the poor. And so immediately the Christian question is, well, who are the vulnerable here? Who are being shafted? Who are being uh, abused and um, by this technology? Because these are the people we have a, a duty to to protect and so on. So these are troubling times. What about the singularity? I think ultimately this is just science fiction. Um, Mm. And and part of the, we haven't talked about this yet, but I do think it's really important. And that is 
science fiction plays a huge role in the whole debate. Hmm. And, and the reason is that virtually every single tech bro in Silicon Valley is a science fiction nerd. They've been raised in all the science fiction greats, starting with Frankenstein, H.G. Wells, Isaac Asimov, and, and so on and so on. And many of them are self-consciously, and they've said this, they're trying to make the science fiction come true. Uh, Elon Musk has said that repeatedly. Other people have said it the same. And so um, the... The fascinating thing is then that science fiction writers are watching what they're doing and then writing new novels. So, uh, you know, a science fiction writer then writes about the metaverse as this fantasy universe where everyone logged in with virtual reality and then lo and behold, <laughs> Zuckerberg says, great idea, well, let's, let's create the metaverse. Um, another writer talks about neural lace, which is these electrodes implanted into the brain, you know, and then Musk says, oh, that's great, I'll make that come true. So, so there's this curious kind of interaction between the science fiction fantasy and reality. And one of the interesting things about American sci-fi in particular is how often it is dystopic. In mm -hmm. other words, in American science fiction, whenever the machines get too intelligent. Whenever the machines start to get stronger and stronger, you know it's not going to end well. Mm. Almost inevitably, there's a dystopic end when, you know, the machines take over. And the tech bros, they know their science fiction. And they're terrified that this is what's going to happen, you know, that we've tried to make the science fiction come true. And lo and behold, whoops, we've just remembered how this ends. And it doesn't end well. It ends with the machines ultimately taking control. And I think, as Christians, we say, well, hang on a minute. You know, is that really the, the future that the God of the universe, the God who's made all this possible, the God who has given human beings the ability to understand um, how to make computers and how to understand the laws of physics, uh, is it really likely that that God of the universe who's, who's created this entire cosmos as a theater for his own drama, for his own purposes, to bring it to fruition. And I, I think we can have a greater confidence with that. I think the fascinating question for the theologians and the biblical scholars is, how does the tech fit into the way that God is planning the future? How does it fit mm. into, ultimately, the new heaven and the new earth? Uh, very interesting, as many theologians have pointed out, the story of salvation starts in a garden, but it ends in a city. Yeah. And, and the glory and the honour of the nations are going to be brought into the new Jerusalem. So is it possible that part of that glory and the honour of the nations is actually cutting-edge technology? Is, is there a place for the best of human ingenuity in the tech world? to be incorporated in the New Jerusalem? I mean, I don't know. This is, this is speculation, but I think these suddenly become quite important questions. Very important questions to which there are no easy answers, hence the call to theologians and philosophers. Let's get moving on this. Now, that's a really, you know, I hadn't thought about the, the interplay between sci-fi and uh, the Silicon Valley bros, the, the, the people who are really running Silicon Valley. That's, that's fascinating. So there's a couple more issues that have sort of been under the surface. You mentioned the vulnerable and the poor. This is who Christians historically, when we've been at our best and we haven't always been at our best, these are the people we care about. And that actually you can make an argument historically is how Christianity advances when we do those things. Yeah. Culture, civilization advances, Christianity gets stronger, not weaker. Um, when we remember what Jesus taught us. Uh, two things about vulnerability, surveillance capitalism and job loss. I'd love to start with surveillance capitalism. You also mentioned China. China is very good at this and using it for malevolent purposes. Your colleague John Lennox mm -hmm. and I talked about that. Um, a little more on surveillance capital. We're all being surveilled. That's in the West, that's in China and beyond. What are the malevolent uses of surveillance capitalism that we have to be aware of? Well, I think this is the fascinating thing, isn't it? So if you compare, mm. on the one hand, we have this capitalism, 
which is utterly ruthless in terms of maximizing profit and is prepared to go to enormous lengths to manipulate us without us realizing in order to maximize profits. Um, and on the other hand, you've got the Chinese and, and to some extent other totalitarian governments using exactly the same technology. But here it's all about social control and uh, may, ensuring that the political masters remain uh, in control. Yeah. Do you and, salute and it, the dollar or do you salute the leader is really what I mean, it comes down to, And right? it's a pretty poor choice, isn't it? If that <laughs> yeah. is all we are left with. Those are, those are really bad it's, choices. It's a really yeah. bad choice. And therefore, I think there's a desperate need to create a third space. Um, and I think theologically, the way I would try to frame it is, is how can this technology be redeemed? Um, it, how can it be brought back out of the hands of evil, out of this corrupt and destructive uh, mechanisms on the one hand, uh, greed and profit maximization, and on the other hand, totalitarian control. How can it be redeemed in a way which really helps human beings to flourish? And is it too naive to think that that's impossible? I, I, I think it probably starts on a small scale. It starts with uh, Christians pioneering, innovating new ways of using technology in a way which does protect the vulnerable, in a way which, um, and you know, I can see that starting to start. Interestingly, you know, there are a lot of Christian believers working in the tech industry. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they, they want to feel that all their expertise and the endless hours they spend coding and staring at screens, they want to feel that their work is actually doing something good for human beings. It's not just lining the pockets of the ultra-rich. And so I think that actually Christians in the tech industry can act as salt and light. They can be the conscience. Uh, they can uh, point out uh, the ways in which technology is being abused and, and can um, and, and maybe pl play a a creative and a redemptive role within the industry. Mm. I think we need to empower Christians in the tech industry and give them the resources and encourage them because I think they're going to play a vital role. Um, so, you know, so often I think one of our failings as Christian believers, and I've seen this time and time again, is that we don't lack faith and we don't lack knowledge and we don't lack prayer on many occasions Really what we lack is innovation, creativity, the ability mm. to think outside the box and say, you know, why don't we try this? Why don't we see if we can do this? And, and that's what I'm praying for. I'm praying for an outpouring of new, innovative, creative ideas of redeeming this technology and using it for good. I think that's a wonderful prayer. Where, where do you expect job loss to hit the most? I mean, easy, easy things would be, look at how the taxi industry was disrupted by Uber. You might say, well, Uber's not AI. Actually, it kind of is. I mean, there's mm, a lot of is. AI powering Uber and Airbnb in the background, and you see hotel industries and taxi industries disrupted. You see small businesses disrupted. But, you know, when you get into self-driving vehicles, trucks, cars, planes... Where, where do you see disruption happening? Well, and what about writers, creative writers? You know, there are masses of people who just create copy, who, you I, know, I, and... I thought of a post today, and, you know, this is August of 2023 when we're recording this, and I thought, the first draft is dead. Like, there's no real reason to produce a first draft anymore entirely on your own. Now, I don't know <laughs> that that's true. I probably will. But there's a lot of really good stuff out there. And I still mm. feel like, yeah, if it goes out and has my name on it, I've, I've crafted it. But I'm a writer. Mm. And I'm looking at writing a book in 2024 for publication the following year. It's like, that's going to be fundamentally different mm -hmm. than me on my last book, which I wrote between 2019 and 2021. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Writers. So, so this is absolutely disruptive across the piece. I think... One of the most troubling things is that what this automation and technology is doing is it's hollowing out the middle grade jobs, mm -hmm. the jobs that were not highly specialized, highly professional, 
the kind of blue collar jobs, the kind of jobs which somebody who 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 didn't have a PhD or a a very sophisticated, but but was able to earn a decent living, was able to you know get job satisfaction and enjoy it. Those kind of middle ranking jobs seem to be the ones that are most vulnerable. And what you end up with is a smaller group of elite, the higher elite. There's always going to be a place for the highly educated, uh, sophisticated, specialised, uh, professional uh, people. But then you've got masses of people like just doing semi-skilled or unskilled jobs, baristas in in coffee shops and mm-hmm. you know warehouse people, even though they are going being disrupted and the but the kind of jobs who drive you know drive a white van and deliver Amazon mm-hmm. parcels and it and and they're they're sort of they're very low grade jobs they're jobs with very little satisfaction they're jobs with very little security uh, they they're they're jobs with very little self respect and I think that is a huge disruptive force uh, and. The challenge will be for the churches, as often, what to do with the people who find that they're unemployable, uh, and how can we uh, help them to see that they still have a role, they still have value. Yeah. In- interestingly, I think we we're going to have to reframe volunteering. I think at the moment, a volunteer is a very low grade, you know, in, in terms of job specification. You know. Volunteer yeah. is kind of bottom of that peep, isn't it? You can't do anything else. Well, at least you can volunteer. Right. And, you know, the idea of someone who's doing an excellent, sophisticated, and valuable job, but they are not being unpaid, or they're being paid a pittance, or they're being mm. paid expenses. Actually, I think there's going to be a lot more people like that. And we need to value those people mm. and support them and help them to see that they are still providing an, an essential part of the community. Um, so giving people a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose, uh, even though their traditional working practices have been completely disrupted. I think that's going to be a huge pastoral challenge for Christian communities and, and for others. I agree. And, you know, that goes back to what's become a central theme of our time together, which is dehumanization, right? Like if you think about the Industrial Revolution, that's what happened. Farm work was hard, but when people went from the country into the city and started working 18-hour days in deplorable conditions and child labor and the whole deal, um, it took the church a little while to kind of wake up, but um, a lot of that was fueled by the Christian faith. No, these aren't machines. These are people. Hmm. And we need to treat them with dignity. They were made in the image of God. Um, anything else on your mind that we didn't touch on? And I know this is the three-day seminar condensed into an hour <laughs> and a bit. But uh, I, I think that this has done an excellent job, and I'm so grateful for you, of framing the problem. Because sometimes we don't even know what the problem is. And if you can't define the problem, you have no idea of how to define a solution. And so I think it's been extremely constructive in that respect. Yeah, there is there is another theme I'd just like to to highlight, which I think is very important, although not an easy one to talk about, and that is mm. about the nature of evil. Mm. The interesting thing is that in the tech world, genuine evil, malevolence, it simply doesn't compute. I mean, why would you... Be malevolent. I mean, yes. you know, they, they understand things like programming errors and mistakes. Mm. They understand things like random disasters. But malevolence, that makes no sense in a world of ones and zeros, in a world of formulae mm. and algorithms and so on. And so there is the astonishing thing about many people in the tech world is they combine a technological technological brilliance with moral naivety. I was going to say, it's a naivete, isn't it? It's, it's like, that doesn't really exist. Yeah, it's, what's the problem? You know, I mean, Mark Zuckerberg says, I'm going to connect every single human being in the planet to every other single human being on the planet. What could possibly go wrong? 
<laughs> and then, you know, and Great history question. tells us what can go wrong and terrible yeah. things happen and, and riots and people get killed and there's sort of... Uh, so that's not a surprise to Christians. I mean, we're not surprised no. by because of our understanding of the fall, our understanding that absolutely everything in humanity and in the rest of the cosmos is, you know, and the world is somehow contaminated by evil, by, by the fall. And so I think having a sort of serious understanding of the nature of evil and of the potential of human evil, and even, you know, the, the language of the powers uh, in, in the New Testament um, this there are a whole number of words that recur repeatedly, words which refer to powers um, and, and authorities and thrones mm -hmm. and uh, agencies and so on. And Bible scholars have often argued about, are these referring to human powers like magistrates and judges and so on, or are they referring to spiritual, demonic powers? And... I think a number of commentators have come to the conclusion, actually, when Paul and the other New Testament writers are writing about these things, they didn't differentiate between human authorities mm. and spiritual authorities. They saw them as in some way in a lockstep, mm. that wherever there is authority, there is both a human component and there is an invisible spiritual component. And But interestingly, what they all said is that ultimately all the powers are going to bow the knee to Jesus. Mm. Powers that are on earth and powers that are in the heavens, all of them will bow the knee to Jesus. And I just wonder whether that, that ancient language hasn't something to teach us as we, as we think about the power of technology. I wonder whether technology isn't becoming one of the powers there, there, there is a human element. There are human beings, and including malevolent human beings, who are using this for their purposes. And it's ex they're exercising authority across the piece. But there are also hidden forces here. Um, and, and yet, those, these authorities and powers are ultimately going to bow the knee to Jesus. They are not the ultimate rulers of the universe. And so as we, you know, I think we just need to work out more about what that means. How do we redeem, bring back these powers under the authority of Jesus? And, mm. uh, and so we don't need to be frightened about the powers. We need to treat them with respect. We need to recognize the way that they can do exercise authority, but ultimately uh, we must be confident that the powers will bow the knee and can be redeemed. Well, thank you for that. And, you know, I think, I think for everybody who's listening to this, this has been probably the single most <laughs> helpful hour I've had in maybe ever on framing the issues around AI and the Christian faith. And I just, I just can't thank you enough for that. And I would say, I'd, I'd like to ask you my final question about a to-do for people who listen. I'd like to add one. Normally, I don't add my commentary, but I would like to say for you to maybe revisit some of the themes that we've covered to think about it. You know, if you're an employer, that this is more than just about maximizing the bottom line. If you're a preacher, these are very real issues. And this is the fear and the uncertainty that I think everybody that you're, you're, you're pastoring and the people in your community you're trying to reach are feeling, but nobody has words for right now. Nobody can really articulate it right now. They don't know what they're afraid of. They don't know what's happening. The information is everywhere. And if you're able to articulate themes like personhood or agency or dignity or uh, caring for the vulnerable or um, challenging or just even reassuring. I mean, ultimately, we are a people of hope. If you're able to frame that in an intelligent way, you're going to be doing a great service. And then finally, I would say a call to 
uh, young leaders who are thinking, what am I going to devote my life to? Uh, how about philosophy and theology that actually addresses these issues? That would be a really good use of your life, like an incredibly, and I mean, at a serious, rigorous academic level, you've taught at Oxford and Cambridge and uh, yeah, higher education isn't everything, but it certainly helps in framing issues like this, uh, Dr. Wyatt. So thank you. Uh, any call to action you would have or request of the audience on this, this issue? Yes, I, I, um, I do think, you know, we, we're called to watch the sign of the times. I mean, Jesus said, mm. you know, you can, you can see when it's going to rain and you see when it's going to be a nice day, but you can't read the sign of the times. And so I think there is a call for us to, to watch, to pray, and uh, not to give way to fear, yeah. but to, uh, to learn uh, and to ask for wisdom. Um, God has given, God doesn't leave us without guidance. He doesn't leave us without insight, you know, I, and, and he doesn't leave us without the resources we need. But it saddens me sometimes that so much of the resources of the church seem to be directed elsewhere at issues which probably are on a bigger scale of history. Are, are less important and and to focus on on some of these issues which do seem to me to be the defining issues of our age at least some of them uh, should really take a high priority so I think laying a foundation of education what does it mean to be human uh, how are we called to serve uh, and asking these questions what kind of world are we trying to build for the future what would it mean to live in a world of technology that actually helped us and helped us to become more the people we were meant to be. You know, that's fascinating. I hadn't actually thought about AI being the defining issue of our age, but that almost immediately resonates. I mean, if you think about the 18th century, it was the century of industrialization and the enlightenment, uh, you know, and, uh, it's funny you talk about the Bronze Age. What was that? That was a technological development. Yeah, the the finding of fire, the invention of the wheel, um, you know, decline of an empire. And you have these meta factors. And I think you're right. We can get very worked up about what's happening on social media or whatever. But what if AI is really the one of or maybe the defining issue of our day? And how will history look back on how we stewarded that and how we handled that? And when theologians and philosophers are playing catch up, that's not really good. And, you know, you reflect what, what Erwin McManus has said a few times on this podcast. Uh, the church historically, when it's been at its best, has innovated. And we're not doing that right now. And perhaps it's a, it's a great opportunity to do that. Wow. This, uh, some interviews over deliver, this one over delivered. Thank you so much, John. Oh, that's great. It's been a privilege. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Any final thought or word? No, thank you so much for what you're doing. And uh, I think we're all part of a global family, aren't we? I think a wonderful yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, people said that uh, technology has often played a significant role in part of God's providential purposes. You know, people have pointed out how significant the invention of printing was yes, for the Reformation. Yes, invention. Mm -hmm. It was at that point, because of the invention of printing, the Reformation had, and the vernacular translations of the Bible, had an unbelievable impact that simply couldn't have happened without printing. And I wonder whether the internet and the ability for us to sit on other sides of the world, and yet as brothers in Christ to actually resonate and learn and support and encourage. Now, this is a new gift. This was, this was impossible. Mm. Even 10 years ago, we wouldn't have been doing this. Yeah. Yeah. And I've been had the privilege of having these conversations, you know, literally with, with Christians, sisters and brothers around the world. And I think we're seeing the global church functioning in a new way, in a way which we've always known in theory we were part of this global network of people, but actually this is becoming a reality in a new way. And that's something that gives me great hope. God has his people. We're learning more of what it means to to work together and learn from one another. Mm. And uh, the best is yet to come. Mm. Dr. John Wyatt, thank you so much. Appreciate it. 
Um, your book is called The Robot Will See You Now. And are you on social media at all? Yeah. So I have a website, johnwyatt.com. Okay. That's excellent. <laughs> And that's got a, uh, articles and stuff. And I also have a podcast called Matters of Life and Death. Um, it's a weekly podcast. It's on the premier unbelievable label. Oh, yes. Um, and, uh, yeah, so if you, could, if you could link to that, that would be great too. 100% we will. Thank you so much. It's been great to talk to you, Gary. God bless. <laughs>